So, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture. Um, the, the, the topic that I've been given is birthplace of monothe monotheism. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is the <coughs> I'm going to talk about the relationship between um, <coughs> Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, I'm not going to speak about um, you know the, uh, the similarities in theology or the uh, differences in theology. I'm not going to talk about um, you know how they have the same origins and uh, and therefore they belong to the same family of religions and therefore there should be uh, tolerance and peace and understanding among the adherents of these three religions. I'm not going to, to talk about that. Okay? I'm rather I have a more specific um, interest. Um, now that has to do with um, the issues taking place today um, around the question of uh, clash of civilizations, clash of religions. Um, we see more and more in the last um, 20, 30 years um, conflict, conflicts that are taking place along the lines of religion. Um, in previous times, um, you know, prior to that, there were always con conflicts, but um, you know, during the world wars, for example, the conflicts were more geopolitical. Um, and not to say that they are not geopolitical today, but uh, they've taken on, many of the conflicts have taken on a religious um, color. Um, whether religion is the, uh, the, the basis of these conflicts, is another matter, right? But the fact is, w whether the basis may be religious or the, the basis may be uh, political or ideological um, or economic, uh, the fact is, uh, these conflicts have taken on a religious uh, coloring. So, that being the case, um, b that being the context, we have seen a rise in interest in interreligious dialogue and interreligious. Um, uh, rapprochement between you know, different uh, religious groups, both within religions as well as uh, outside of religion, uh, within particular religion or between religions. So for example, we have now in the last few years um, efforts to um, bring Sunnis and Shiites together. Right? This would be intra-religious dialogue. Um, we've seen similar efforts among Christians you know, between Catholics and Protestants. Um, but um, there's also the issue of interreligious dialogue. Uh, you see that many of the conflicts uh, today, uh, long-standing Palestinian-Israeli conflict, there is an element uh, of um, uh, you know, religious conflict there, an element, um, particularly between Muslims and Jews, but also involving Christians because Palestinians are, there's a sizable Christian minority among Palestinians. Um, and contrary to what people think, um, there have also been, you know, Palestinian Christian uh, terrorists. Uh, terrorism not, you know, just associated with uh, with Muslims. Um, so that's the context. When we talk about interreligious dialogue, um, and we can talk about many religions, uh, but we're talking here about. Um, um, the monotheistic religions, and in particular, I would like to, to speak about um, uh, Islam and Christianity, but also, you know, I think I'll make some uh, mention of Judaism as well. But my approach is a bit different from uh, <clears throat> what uh, people usually talk about when they talk about interreligious dialogue. Usually, when people talk about interreligious dialogue, they talk about um, you know the different religious groups, their differences, their similarities. Um, historical examples of, um, of peace and tolerance um, and then they make prescriptions about what these religious groups should be doing in order to 
to come together to, you know, to forge uh, closer understanding and awareness and stuff like that. This is the usual, usually the, uh, the, the content of um, talks about interreligious dialogue. So my approach is a little bit different. I want to, to say that for there to be um, um, peace between different religious communities, obviously, obviously there has to be understanding and there has to be awareness and there has to be respect. But how can that be created? Now, my approach is to say that that can be created. Now, if we're talking about, let's say, the relations between the West and the Muslim world, one has to go beyond simply saying that there are common values and you know, similar beliefs, uh, and therefore, um, Christians in the West and Muslims in the Muslim world should come together. We have to go beyond that, right? Um, how do we go beyond that? We need to talk about how Muslims and Christians actually are not simply, you know, uh, from two religious communities that have similarities, but we need to say that they actually belong to the same civilization. So I think this is, that's, my, the, that's my main point. Okay? Um, so how do I make that point, or how do I argue that point? Now, if we begin with um, the history of uh, these religions, um, we usually think of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as three separate religions. But if we, um, we look at um, the origin of these three religions, um, we see that they have one origin, right? The so-called Abrahamic um, faiths. Um, and if you look at Islam itself, Islam emerged among the, the Arabs. And the Arabs, like the Jews, are descendants of uh, Noah uh, through the, the uh, son of Noah, Shem. Um, and both Jesus and, and Muhammad are descendants of the patriarch, uh, the patriarch Abraham. Um, through Isaac, Jesus th from Isaac, and uh, uh, Muhammad from, um, from Ismail. Um, and you know that uh, Muhammad was, uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, was born in um, Mecca, which was a mercantile town in Arabia, which is today called Saudi Arabia. Um, and um, he saw as his mission to bring back the people of Arabia to the, what he saw to be the true teachings of Abraham. Right? So it wasn't just the creation of a new religion. I mean, historically, a new religion called Islam, historically speaking. But in a sense, it was simply a continuation of existing religion, a continuation of, of a religion that had already been revealed to Abraham and to succeeding uh, prophets, right? So the, the Muslim belief is that Muhammad was the last of these prophets. Um, so in a sense, he, Islam is the last religion, but it's also the primordial or the first religion, right? Maybe not under the name Islam, but under the name of uh, uh, revelation from the one true God which was, and, and that revelation first, you know, came to earlier prophets uh, before the prophet Muhammad, to the prophet Abraham and so on and so forth, uh, so forth to the prophet Moses and prophet Jesus and so on. Um, so historically Islam is the, the third major Semitic religion. Um, it's closely related to Judaism and Christianity, of course. It accepts all the prophets of uh, Judaism as prophets of Islam. It accepts Jesus, but not in the way that Christians do, but as a, as a prophet. Um, and, you know, you might be familiar with the, you know, the corresponding uh, names of biblical prophets and, and their corresponding names in, in Islam. So you've got um, um, Job, Prophet Job is, re is referred to in Islam as, uh, as Ayub. Daud is David. Um, Hud, 
hood, there is no, uh, I don't think there's an equivalent. The prophet hood, whose, whose uh, grave is in, uh, in, in the Hadramaut in Yemen, in the southern part of Yemen. Um, Ibrahim, Abraham, of course. Um, Elias, Elias. Isa, Jesus. Ishaq or Isaac. Uh, Ismail for Ish Ishmael. Um, uh, Lut for Lot. Musa for Moses, Nu for No, and so on and so forth. All right? Now, given that the three religions have, the common, have common origins, the problem is that in the West today, now of course I'm not blaming the conflict between between uh, whatever conflict there is between the West and the Muslim world, and there has been conflict for centuries, we're not saying that this is basically a religious conflict. And whatever the nature of that conflict is, I'm not saying that the West is to blame. Right? Um, clearly, there are problems on both sides. Um, after all, the Muslims did um, uh, the, the, the early, you know, uh, in the early days of Islam, the, the um, Umayyad Arabs in the 7th century um, conquered the Iberian Peninsula and they ruled there for about 700 years. The Ottoman Turks and the Arabs also ruled in Sicily for about 500 years. The Ottomans uh, ruled over parts of uh, Europe getting as far as uh, Austria for about 700 years as well. Um, so the Muslims were conquerors of, uh, of uh, European society um, and uh, that has something to do, it played a role in the, uh, the stereotypes and prejudices that Europeans had about uh, Islam. Europeans themselves were colonial powers um, and much of the colonial world was, uh, was Muslim, was Islamic. So Muslims also have a, you know, um, a, uh, a problem with, uh, with the West um, and colonialism has a lot to do with it. So there are problems on both sides. But um, when we take all, that, all of that into account, um, and we want to talk about peace and understanding, quite apart from the political problems, the geopolitical problems, the problems of you know, imperialism, uh, the problems of um, you know, state domination of superpowers like the US or the Soviet Union, or you know, the, um, some of the European powers, um, in today's context, dominating countries in the third world, including Muslim countries, quite apart from that, solving those problems, it's a different kind of problem to solve. When we look at, at the level of culture, of religion, um, clearly the, there is a role for mutual understanding. So my point is that when, you, when we see that the three religions have common origins, have common roots, historically, geographically, even culturally, the problem in Europe today is, and the West in general, the West sees itself as Judeo-Christian. It understands that it has the same roots, that, uh, that the Western roots are Judeo and Christian. It identifies itself as Judeo-Christian. Now, my argument is that the West is no less Islamic than it is Judeo. It, no less Islamic than it is uh, Judaic, we put it that way, all right? In some ways, we can say that the West is more Islamic than it is uh, Jewish in terms of its origins. So this is basically what I'm, uh, I'm arguing, right? Is that, that clear? Um, now, the term Judeo-Christian is something that emerged um, in the late 18th century, early 19th uh, century. Uh, now, it, it, it's meant many things, um, but uh, one of the things, of course, it means is that it's recognition of the idea that um, Judaism and Christianity have uh, similar roots, um, you know, to the extent that the, you know, there is significant overlap between the, the Torah and the, and the Christian Bible, the Old Testament. Um, they share the same prophets and, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, uh, in fact, um, in the Second World War, during the, during the time when the Nazis uh, were 
um, in the, the Nazi period in, uh, in Europe, there was also an attempt to stress the Judeo-Christian nature of European civilization as sort of an anti-Semitic, uh, an anti-Nazi um, um, you know, approach, fighting anti-Semitism. Um, there was that reaction to say that you know, Jews and Christians belong to the same um, civilization. Um, so the, the furthest the West has gone in terms of bringing together um, religions is in this notion of Judeo-Christian um, civilization. And I think this idea of the West being Judeo-Christian is even stronger in the US than, than in Europe. Um, now, more recently, um, some people, in particular, I, I, I don't know whether you've all read that article by Richard uh, Bullet. Did you? No. This, I think we sent it to them, right? Some people did. Uh, the uh, Judeo, um, um, uh, the, this, some people are saying, well, where did, you know, why, why doesn't Islam, where does Islam fit in? The West is Judeo-Christian, but isn't there a significant um, um, element in Western culture which is Islamic? Um, so people are thinking along those lines, saying, let's talk about Islamo-Christian civilization. You didn't read the article, so... <laughs> anyway, the article that I sent you, to, that, that I was asked to, you know, to give to you, two articles, one was an article by me, and the other one was an article by uh, this professor, Richard Bullet from the US. He wrote an, a piece called... Uh, he wrote a piece making a case for Islamo-Christian civilization. Now, it's not exactly the same, or it's not exactly a parallel to Judeo-Christian civilization. Judeo-Christian civilization says that the West, although predominantly Jew uh, Christian, has also significant Jewish influence. So it, it sees itself as not just Christian, but Judeo-Christian, right? But in this idea of Islamo-Christian civilization, the argument is a bit different. The argument is that you have Christianity in the West, and outside of the West, you have the Muslim world. And there are significant similarities between them and significant shared history between them that we should consider the whole thing, the West and the Muslim world, as one large Islamo-Christian civilization. You get the point? Okay. Now, I think that that's a very weak argument. Because, just because, there are similarities between two civilizations, you know, Western Christianity and Islam. Just because there are similarities, and you, just because you identify those similarities, it doesn't mean there's going to be peace. Because, you know, the worst of, uh, the, the most, uh, um, um, you know, brutal of wars had been fought between people who belong to the same civilization. First World War, the Second World War, um, wars between Christians, uh, Catholics, and Protestants. These are all wars between people who belong to the same civilization. Um, so, um, just being similar, in fact, perhaps one could argue that similarity breeds more contempt. Because, you know, um, when you are similar and you belong to the same roots, you expect the one expects the other to conform. Whereas if you are very dissimilar, well, the, the person is out of your group anyway, so you don't accept, expect that conformity. So this um, recognition of similarities between Christianity and Islam, between the West and the Muslim world, uh, I think is not a sufficient ground for bringing the two together in one civilization. My approach is a little bit different. I would like to say that the, um, the West shouldn't only think of Islam as a civilization that has many similarities with it. Of course, that's good to do that. But they should go beyond that. They should think of 
Islam as part of their civilization. You understand? They should think of Islam when they, th when they think about their identity. They should think of their identity as not just Christian. They are certainly predominantly Christian. They should think of identity as uh, uh, having Jewish elements. That's why they say Judeo-Christian. But they should also think of their identity in terms of um, the role that Islam has played in the formation of European Western civilization. This is the issue, this is the point that is overlooked. Islam is seen something as totally foreign and outside of European civilization, when actually it is, it is not. You know, and that's what I want to, um, uh, to, to say. That, that Islam has played a very important role in the formation of uh, European civilization. Um, and I'd like to give a few um, examples of that. <coughs> in, uh, see, Christianity emerged about 2,000 years ago. For a few hundred years, um, for the first few hundred years of Christianity, there was no competition to Christianity, right? Um, the, um, I mean, you know, early, all the religions like um, Juda Judaism, a lot of Jews, most Jews converted to Christianity. Um, and um, um, there were small Jewish populations um, uh, in, in Europe, um, but there was no, proselytization, there was no conversion of Christians to, uh, to Judaism. Um, and the other religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and other religions, um, they, they were you know, very far away from, from Europe, from Christendom. Um, and again, you don't have this competition where you know, uh, these, these religions are competing with each other for, for converts. So there's no, con no competition with Christianity. But with the rise of Islam, in the uh, uh, 6th century, you have, um, suddenly you have a new religion at the very border, at, at, at the borders of Christendom, right? right? Arabia. First of all, you have Christians, prior to the rise of Islam, you have Christians in, uh, uh, the majority population in the Middle East was Christian, with some Jews and some Zoroastrians, but mainly Christians. So Islam emerges there. Uh, within uh, you know, a couple of centuries, the majority of people converted to, uh, of, of, of Jews and Christians have converted to Islam. And then you have a large new religious community, uh, and a large one at that, sharing, uh, uh, bordering, uh, um, how's your geography? What were they bordering? They were bordering, um, Egypt was already Muslim by then. They were, they were bordering the Mediterranean. That means the, south, the northern Mediterranean. Greece, uh, Spain, Italy, right? These were, these were Christian countries. To make matters worse, the Arabs invaded, conquered the Iberian Peninsula, what is now Spain and Portugal, Sicily. Um, this was the Arabs. Uh, and then some centuries later, the Ottomans. Uh, Ottomans uh, ruled over um, a large part of uh, North Africa, what is called the Middle East today, but also southern European countries, you know, Bulgaria, um, Greece. Um, Greece has been under Ottoman rule for far longer than it has been, a, you know, a, a republic. Um, Spain and Portugal were under Arab rule for about 700 years. Um, now, this conquest and this, um, you know, the fact that Muslims were there, Arabs and Turks, were in Europe for so long, meant that there was a significant degree of uh, um, transmission of, uh, of culture. It's interesting to note that although the Arabs and the Turks were in these places for, for centuries, these populations did not convert to Islam. 
for the most part. The vast majority of Spaniards never became Muslims. They remained as Jews and Christians. Uh, and for most, in most of uh, southern Europe, with the exception of the Balkans, where you know, in Bosnia they became, and Albania they became Muslim, but Bulgaria, Romania, Greece remained uh, Christian uh, countries. Because the, the Ottomans, generally the Muslims never had a policy of, of conversion. Right? Um, so we find in some countries there was an, a process of conversion because people, for, what, for whatever reasons, um, uh, whatever historical reasons, uh, people became Muslims, but in other places they did not become Muslims, although they were living under Muslim rule. Now, um, the, the fact that Muslims were in Europe, and the fact that at any rate Muslims, the, the Muslim world and Europe shared a common border, Europe never shared any border with any other religious community. Mainly, it was always with, uh, from, you know, from in the beginning, there was no border. Uh, I mean, before Islam. And then when Islam emerged, then you have, uh, they have a border with, uh, with Muslims. So, European contact with other civilizations often, f first of all, the contact, the, the greatest contact that Europe had with another civilization was, was with Islam. And e European contact with other civilizations, like the Chinese and Indians, very often happen through the Muslim world, right? Uh, for example, through, this, you know, through the, the various trade routes, whether maritime or overland. China and Europe had contact through the Silk Route, but it was through the Muslim world, right? Same thing with uh, the contact between India and, uh, and, the, um, and the Europeans. So the fact that the most, the dominant contact was between West and Islam meant that there would have been a significant influence of Islamic civilization on, uh, on Europe. All right? I want to give some examples of that to make that point. To make the point that Europe should see itself as not just Judaic but also Islamic. Does anybody have any uh, idea about that? But, yeah. If not talk in terms of language, for how, for example, the English language mm. or, or a lot of the um, Latin languages have influence from Arabic. Arabic, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, we can speak about, you know, uh, those kinds of influences in, uh, in language. Um, Alcohol, although we don't really take alcohol, but it's from us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the word is from us. <laughs> yeah. um, and algebra, and chances are any word beginning with AL is uh, from Arabic. <laughs> and, and went to Europe through, uh, through the um, Muslim, through contact with Muslims or through Muslim um, conquest. Um, many scientific uh, terms, uh, the, the many scientific terms, uh, because of the growth of science uh, in um, among the Muslims, and the transmission of uh, science from um, the Muslim world to to Europe. Um, that's an interesting, um, you know, phenomenon. Um, the, the the Muslim world is extremely back, backward in um, scientific production today. Um, I think um, if you look at the total output of, uh, in terms of some of the sciences or, or the sciences as a whole in the Arab world, they are less than, uh, um, less than Israel compared to the entire Arab world with, uh, with Israel. And um, scientific output in Iran and Turkey is much higher than in the, the Arab world. Uh, but still, Iran and Turkey are not very high in terms of international standards. Um, but in the, in the medieval period, uh, the centers of learning in many fields, in science, but also in philosophy, uh, in literature, in theology, um, were in the Muslim world. So much so that 
you had Europeans who, from various parts of Europe, who went to Spain when Spain was under Muslim rule to study in universities there to learn philosophy. Um, there were philosophical schools of thought um, which were um, started by Muslims which were very influential in Europe. For example, there's a philosopher, a medieval philosopher by the name of Ibn Rushd, Ibn Rushd, known in Latin as Averroes. And Averroes had a, a big following in, in, among European philosophers, so much so there was a European school of Averroism called Latin Averroism. Right? Many scientific discoveries um, um, in, in various fields, algebra, geometry, um, chemistry, physics, optics, were, were made by Muslims. When I say Muslims because they were not only Arabs. In fact, most of them were not Arabs. Um, many of them were Persians um, and Turks from, from Central Asia. Um, some were Arabs. Many of them were Spanish Arabs, Arabs who were born in Spain after the Muslim conquest of Spain and grew up in Spain. Um, so many discoveries, were, scientific discoveries were made by them. Um, uh, many uh, uh, philosophical uh, theories, um, theological doctrines, um, theories in logic which were uh, pioneered by Muslims were then um, adopted by Europeans. This was the, here I'm referring to the original contribution of, of Muslims. But apart from that, the Muslims also re, um, uh, what, re, re um, discovered Greek learning, which was suppressed by the Europeans. Because there was a time in medieval times that the church suppressed some of the teachings of uh, Greek philosophy. Um, for example, and some of these teachings were, were lost, or lost to them rather, but they were discovered by Muslims and uh, uh, translated to Arabic, uh, and the Europeans became reacquainted with the Greek tradition through the translations of Greek works from Greek into Arabic. And some of these works were then retranslated back to uh, you know, to, to, to uh, not to, I don't think to Greek, but to, to Latin, right? And then, of course, later on to other European languages. So um, uh, they also played that important role of uh, rediscovering the European heritage, um, which then um, was transmitted to the Europeans themselves. Um, so if we talk about and that explains why you have Arabic words in, uh, in, English, in European languages. Uh, if you look at the words, you know, scientific words, because they, of the influence of, Arab, of Islamic science, uh, but you also have some Arabic words in, um, uh, in um, geography and maritime, uh, uh, some ge geographical and maritime uh, terminology, because there was also some influence there some of the early maps that the Europeans used um, to navigate around the world came from Arabs. Um, so words like admiral, the word admiral comes, apparently comes from Arabic, Amir al-Bahar, the prince of the, literally the prince of the, of the sea. Um, and some, ge some geographical terms like, you know, the rock of uh, Gibraltar. Where does that come from? Uh, what is it there? I forget. It's come, it's come from an Arabic word. Gibraltar. Tariq al Tariq? Jabal Tariq. Yeah. Um, which means the mountain or the hill of Tariq, right? N named after a rock, uh, kind of a hill named um, after a person. Um, I'm, you know, I can't think of other words, but uh, there are. Um, so, when we look at science, which is a major part of civilization, you find that there is that 
significant impact of, of Islam on Europe, right? And we're not talking about one or two books, or one or two ideas. We're talking about ideas that help to shape Europe. I mentioned Latin Averroism, right? Averroes was a philosopher from uh, Spain, a Muslim philosopher, an Arab from Spain, who, um, um, among other things, um, wrote about how reason and revelation could be reconciled. And his understanding of how this reconciliation could take place was so influential because the Christians were thinking about the same thing in Europe, how to reconcile reason and revelation. So he was so influential that, as I said, there was a school, uh, a European Christian school of philosophy that followed him, Latin Averroism. And this had a very important impact on the emergence of the uh, European Enlightenment, which is the cornerstone of, you know, European civil of modern European civilization. So that's just one example. But even if you look outside of the field of, uh, well, before I go to other fields, right? We're still on science, okay? So I talked about the influence of Islamic science on Europe. But not just the influence of Islamic science, also the institutions where science is done, all right? Well, what am I supposed to? Yeah, okay. Now, this is. Uh, you see, this, this is one of the earliest universities in the world, Zaituna University. It's in Tunis, Tunis, uh, the capital of Tunisia. Um, now, I was talking about Islamic knowledge, transmission of Islamic knowledge, but even the structures of the knowledge institutions also played a role in European civilization. The very idea of an institution where you get a degree comes from the Muslims. You understand? The idea of a university, right? Not that there were no universities or places where you study you know, in, in around the world before that. But you know, what is so characteristic of our education system today is that you go, you study, and, uh, and then um, you, you are tested, and then you are given a degree. Okay? Does anybody know what the degree is called in Europe, in Italy, in France, in Spain? Anyone knows? Uh, uh, yeah, we, we call it we, yeah, bachelor's degree, but what, is the, what word degree is used? What is, what is the word for degree? No one, there's no European here? No European. Anyone knows? Come on, somebody must know. Um, okay, well, in, uh, in France, in France? Licence, who said that? Licence, yes. What does licence mean? Yeah? Uh, no, 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 that's, li that's lisan. Yeah, <laughs> good, good point. Uh, licence is a licence. Licencia in Spanish or Italian. Um, uh, license. Now, institutions in Europe granting license to students emerged after their corresponding institutions in the Muslim world. License is simply a Latin translation of the Arabic word ijaza. Ijaza is what is used in Arabic. Okay? It means permission. Um, so, before the first centuries before the first universities in Europe started giving licence, you already had um, Zaituna in, in uh, Tunis, Al Azhar in Egypt, uh, uh, and a few other places in the Muslim world who were doing this. But it's not just that. It's not just you know that you know uh, the word is borrowed and translated. It's not just that. It's the whole structure of the of the institution. Um, for example, the idea of the graduation, right? When you get a, when you get your degree or your licence, how do you get it? You go through a ceremony, right? And you, you use a cap and a gown, right? That also comes from the Muslims. Um, how, how, how did it work in the, in the early Muslim institutions? The, uh, first of all, the education was not mass education, it was one-on-one, -on -one, yes? So you, you uh, studied under a teacher, 
when the teacher felt you were ready, he gives you permission to uh, to transmit what he taught to you. Uh, and he symbolizes that permission by putting his turban on your head or his robe on your back. That's the origin of the cap and gown ceremony, right? Um, and uh, the full phrase, you know, so he, then it, sometimes it's even written. He says, he gives you ijazah. And the full phrase in Arabic is ijazah bihaqqa riwayah. Ijazah bihaqqa riwayah. Uh, permission, to, permission for the right to transmit. Right? There were a couple of Orientalists, you know, Western scholars of Islam, about 100 years ago. They suggested that this term, bihaqqa riwayah, is actually the origin of the term bakalorea. It's, it's, a, it, it's a corruption, right? And many words in, in, in there are some words in English derived from Arabic which are corruptions, like Amir al Bahar, Admiral, uh, Tariq al Jabal, Jabal al Tariq, Gibraltar, uh, um, Guad, uh, there's a place in Spain called uh, Guada Javir. It's, um, it's a, supposed to be a corruption of Wadi al-Kabir, big, uh, big valley. You know? So you find many words in European languages that are corruptions of Arabic. And this, when, 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 a, when a word goes from one language to another, there's some corruption. right? So they suggest that Bakaloria is a corruption of Bihaqa um, Riwaya. And that theory is strengthened by the... Um, fact that apparently there's no root word in Latin for baccalaurea. So it doesn't seem to be an originally Latin word. Okay? Um, um, so I was talking about the... Then there are other things about the university. Have you ever wondered why the university is divided into faculties? You know? Why is it called a faculty? So apparently the... Um, the idea, you know, comes from the Arabic word quwa, which means power. Faculty of the, uh, the faculty of sight, the faculty of sound, the faculty of speech, and so on and so forth, right? And then the Muslims have this idea that, you know, the um, uh, the uh, that knowledge um, knowledge is based on different faculties. Um, so. Uh, Perhaps that's also an influence on, in, on, um, uh, on the European institutions. But there are, there are some interesting differences, though. In the early Muslim universities, uh, up until um, the, um, I would say, 16th, 17th, 18th century even, depending on which country you're talking about, the universities were not under the state. The universities were uh, charitable endowments, wakaf in Arabic. They were, in others, they were what we would today call foundations or NGOs, privately funded. Okay? Um, but the nature of that foundation is such that the person who grants the money, let's say a person says, I grant this land and this amount of money to establish um, a university. Now, by law, by Islamic law, um, that uh, foundation has to serve that purpose in perpetuity, forever. Has to serve that purpose. So the law, uh, in other words, protects the wishes of the person who gave that endowment. You understand what I'm saying? Um, whereas if... Uh, if, if I establish a university but not under this category of an endowment, um, the people who take it over after me are free to sell it and change its function and so on. Yeah? Let's say I build a building and I, and, I, and I say this building is a university and I make it a university and it functions as a university. Um, but uh, after um, some years, I can sell it to somebody else and the other person can um, Convert it from a university into a hotel, if he wants to. But if I establish this university as an endowment, a wakaf, 
as an endowment, uh, then by law it has to always function, and I say that this endowment is for the purpose of education for, for university, by law it has to function as that. Understand? Now we find that the early European universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Paris University, were also founded on the basis of what they call charitable endowments. The, char the word charitable endowment is actually a translation of wakaf, which is the Arabic word. Right? So we find that the early universities in the Muslim world, like Zaituna, were based on charitable endowments, on wakaf, and the European universities that came some centuries later followed the same system. The only difference, there were, there were differences of course, the European universities were, um, were, under, were, were, were under the uh, authority of the church. So the, the, the degree or the, the license, the license, was issued by the church. And it's interesting, and this shows the exact opposite to what things are like today. The church could, um, because the church issues the degree, the church had a say over what was taught. So there were, there were times, for example, where the church would ban certain teachings in the universities. Aristotle's, some of Aristotle's works were particularly you know, um, uh, singled out for, for banning because they were held to be against uh, church teachings. Now in the Muslim world of that time, there was no authority controlling the universities because the universities were private charitable endowments. So there was no authority, neither the state uh, no, and no religious authority that um, oversaw the curriculum. The curriculum was decided by the teachers. So in a sense, in those days, there was more uh, academic freedom in the Muslim universities than in the European universities. Now it's ironic that all, Muslim, all universities in the Muslim world are under the state. And you have private universities flourishing in the, in the Western world. It's kind of you know, opposite. But just from this example, you can see the impact of, European, of Islamic civilization on Europe in terms of transmission of knowledge, but also in terms of the evolution of the, uh, the university. But even if we look at um, other areas of life, um, well, I just wanted to say, this is the great uh, scholar Ibn Khaldun, who was born in Tunis, and he studied, he was an alumni of, uh, alumnus of uh, Zaituna University. I don't know if you ever heard of Ibn Khaldun. No? He was a very important scholar. Very, very important. I wrote two books about him, so... <laughs> <laughs> must be important. If you haven't heard of him, then either I have wasted my time on some insignificant scholar or... <laughs> Um, now, if we look at other areas of life, the, the Muslims also had significant impact on uh, uh, on Western civilization. And I'd like to give uh, this is a you know, typical scene from um, Christian history, right? From you know, this is of course. Um, what is it? It's mother and child. Obviously, it is, uh, it is um, Mary and Jesus, right? Oh, yeah, the Virgin and the Child with St. John. Okay, now what's uh, interesting about this? Where's the Islamic influence? Carpet. The carpet. And there are so many examples of paintings, um, but they're not just paintings because they reflect the reality. The reality is that throughout churches in medieval Europe, you had carpets made by Muslims, all right? Especially Turkish carpets and Persian carpets. Most of the carpet uh, producers in the world are uh, Muslims anyway. Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, um, Morocco, Egypt, Central Asia. Um, 
but Turkish carpets and Persian carpets were very popular in medieval Europe. And, you know, they're not just fab fabric, right, that you stand on. They, um, the carpets themselves, uh, they the, the themes, the, the motifs, the designs, express an Islamic worldview. That's why I think it's very interesting that these pieces of art, which express an Islamic worldview, found themselves in, in you know, not just in people's homes, but in uh, places of worship, in um, Christian places of worship. Um, why, do, why do I say they express Islamic worldviews? See, if you compare Chinese carpets with uh, carpets made by Muslims, um, carpets made by Muslims generally have geometric designs, um, which um, uh, signify, among other things, uh, in the orderliness and the infinity of the universe. Um, you have a tree of life that comes from, you know, uh, one of the verses of the Quran about uh, shajara. The, the, the Shajara to Kaun, the tree of existence. Uh, this is a, a very frequent theme in uh, woven carpets. Um, you have a lot of, uh, in Chinese carpets, you have a lot of empty spaces. In carpets made by Muslims, generally there are no empty spaces because there is this idea that it reflects the idea that there's no such thing as nothing because everything is either God or what God created. There's no void. Yeah? So that's what I mean when I say that this art form expresses an Islamic worldview. But this art form that expresses an Islamic worldview was a very important part of uh, Christianity. Right? In the, church, the famous medieval churches and cathedrals, in paintings. I think there are a couple more. Yeah, here's another one. Of course, this is not in a church, but this is in a home, right? Just to drive home the point that here's an example, an aspect of Islamic civilization that was integral to, to European um, life. The next time you look at a medieval painting, see if you can find a, a carpet. Um, And you know, we can go on with other examples. Nursery rhymes. Your stories, you know, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, Sinbad, the sailor, these are from Muslims. No European would say that Sinbad is a foreign story, right? It's part of them, they're growing up. Many of the aspects of everyday life, we don't talk about the big things like science and philosophy or the origin of the university, but even aspects of everyday life, you know, um, uh, sherbet ice cream, sherbet, they probably picked it up from the Muslims during the Crusades. Sherbet derived from an Arabic word, sharbat. Even the word syrup derived from sharab in Arabic. Pepper derived from filfil. Um, sugar is from sukkar, the Arabic word sukkar. So you look at aspects of everyday life, you also find some Islamic uh, influence. So, you know, th that's my point, right? The, that the Europeans need to look at Islam not just as uh, a religion that has similar roots and is similar to them in many ways although that is also true, but they have to see Islam as part of the making of their own civilization. Not as a stranger that we need to be close with, but as something familiar, something that, that we came from. Right? When they start to look at Islam in that way, then it changes everything. It would change the way they look at, uh, the, the way they relate to Muslims. So that's, I think, the main... Uh, the main idea. So monotheistic religions doesn't simply mean that Judaism, Islam and Christianity have uh, similar roots, but that all three religions are part of the making of uh, European or Western civilization. So the West should think of itself 
not just as Judeo-Christian, but as Judeo-Christo-Islamic. Thank you. you Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, so my question is, uh, if, so, so would your argument apply the other way as well? Would you, th would you say that the Islamic world should see Western civilization as part of its formation as well? And uh -huh. the second question, uh, second part to that is, practically speaking, how do you get entire civilizations to reorient the way they think about themselves? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I would also look at it the other way around, definitely. Both in terms of uh, history as well as our contemporary society. Of course, it's easy to make the case for today because the Muslim world is, for the last um, couple of centuries or more, has been significantly influenced by the West, right? Um, and like it or not, it's impossible to uh, to reverse the process and to return to something pre-modern or pre-Western, it's impossible. So whatever influence we have from Western civilization is, is, uh, is here to stay, it has transformed us and it's part of our, of our identity. Uh, it's even part of the identity of people who think of themselves and express themselves in an anti-Western way. Um, many of the uh, Islamist uh, uh, groups um, that um, may engage in a very anti-Western rhetoric, but they participate in Western-style parliamentary democracy, for example. Right? Um, so th that, that point has to be made. But even if you look at the past, um, many aspects of Islamic civilization are significantly influenced by, by the West even before the West was a dominant civilization, truly. For example, uh, the form of uh, the mosque that we, we associate with the typical mosque, the dome, doesn't come from Islam. It comes from Christianity. Uh, t typical Ottoman era mosque that you, you would have seen, the blue mosque, for example, in Istanbul. Uh, any mosque you see w when you see pictures of Turkey, these are, in, these are all influenced by the, the great uh, church of St. Sophia, which was a Byz Byzantine mosque um, built in the fifth century, I think. Uh, and it, it, it so enamored the uh, Ottoman architects that they built many Ottoman era mosques uh, following that um, uh, example. And other you know, uh, you know, mosques um, in other parts of the Muslim world where you have the dome structure, are also influenced by Roman architecture and um, other influences. Um, so to answer your question, yes, you have to look at it uh, both ways. Then the uh, second question was, how do you do, do this? Look, look you know, can you, how, how, do, you, how do you get a, um, how do you get society to, um, to, how do you get men to be less uh, misogynist? It's also utopian. You have, for, for centuries, for, for time immemorial, we've had you know, chauvinistic men out there, right? But we never say we're going to give up and we don't talk about it, we don't speak against it, right? So similarly, um, to say that something is difficult to achieve is, is not a reason for not talking about it. Um, like any cause that we may have in any field, in any area, uh, it's a matter of, of persuading people. And how do you persuade people? That, you know, pe people have different ways of uh, going about it. Um, we, inter-religious dialogue is already a big thing around the world. Many organizations, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is a major religious institution in the, in the UK, in, in the world actually, because he's sort, sort of the de facto leader of all um, 
Anglicans around the world, organizes on a yearly basis uh, the Building Bridges Seminar between Christians and, and Muslims. And there are many other organizations that are doing these things. So, so interreligious dialogue is already something big around the world. Um, so the kind of things I'm talking about would be things that would be discussed or could be discussed at interreligious dialogues. Also, you know, leaders, heads of state, um, ought to um, promote, uh, well, I'm not saying they should promote my idea, but they ought to promote such ideas rather than promoting, um, and they have, you know, right? um, some of the leaders um, in the past, some prominent leaders from different countries have been very instrumental in uh, um, encouraging inter-civilizational dialogue uh, at the level of, of the United Nations, for example. So you have the UN Alliance of Civilizations project. Um, on the other hand, you have leaders like um, uh, Trump who, uh, who sort of promote the reverse. Um, so it's not as utopian as you, know, um, you might think, but it needs support and, and promotion. And for me, even doing things like this on a small scale is still worthwhile. You may not be able to get the whole civilization to, to think that way, but what about getting groups, individuals, um, um, you know, on a smaller scale? Hi, thank you for your lecture. Sure. Um, I'm interested to find out um, what were the origins of this Azring, of uh, the Islamic world to begin with, uh, which continues today. Do you think it's really uh, based in religious differences and uh, sort of um, directed by leaders of religions for you know political reasons, or is it anything to do with the politics of government centering around the fact that the Middle East has a lot of the oil? So, yeah, just some insight in, into that. Yeah, no, the, the, the othering predates uh, the discovery of oil, right? Um, and it is, to some extent, based on religious sentiments. As I, as I said earlier, the um, Muslims were, and even today, I would say, Islam is the only religion that competes with Christianity. If you think about it, there are only two world religions, Islam and Christianity. And when I, when I say that other religions are not world religions, that's not meant to be a critique of those religions. It's not to denigrate them, right? When I, when I say, uh, um, if you define world religions as religions with a universal message, then Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism are all world religions, because they all have universal messages. But uh, if you define a world religion as a religion that in practice, it's actually spread throughout the world. It's basically Islam and Christianity that do that. Right? Other religions have generally been confined to certain geographical areas. Um, but Christianity and Islam from day one spread throughout the world, across geographical regions, across cultures, and you know, sort of integrated into uh, the cultures of the places that they went to across different classes, you know, from the ruling classes all the way down to the, to the masses, uh, um, across the, you know, the, the class divide. So these are the two religions that generally are a th see each other as a threat. Right? So Christianity is the first to come. And then suddenly you have Islam. A few hundred years, Christianity has no competitor. Suddenly you have Islam. And it's not only a threat in terms of its teachings, but physically, because it went to Europe and occupied Europe for centuries. So that must have had an impact on, you know, on the way Europeans thought about Islam. Um, they, you know, they, um, they were very critical of Islam. They, in some cases, they thought of Islam as a heretical form of Christianity. Um, and they thought of Muhammad as the Antichrist. Um, but there's also something else about European civilization the tendency to look at all other civilizations as inferior. This is what is understood as Orientalism. It did not apply only to Islam, but also to other civilizations. Um, uh, so 
the othering of Islam has something to do with the conduct of Muslims themselves, the conquest of, uh, of Europe. But it also has to do with um, the, the European propensity to orientalize uh, others. Right? Um, and this predates European conquest. With European conquest, then it takes on a different form. Uh, because not only are the Europeans uh, uh, thinking of the inferiority of other civilizations, uh, but they're actually ruling over them. And then they have a, a chance, uh, the, the, the ability to influence the other's perception. Just to take the case of Singapore. Um, he, in Singapore, you know, Raffles is, is sort of idealized, right? Um, but, you know, Raffles is also the architect of the kinds of things that we see wrong with Singapore. For example, people, for those who will be critical of the CMIO category, this, you know, uh, goes back, this racial categorization goes back to uh, the British. Prior to that, we don't have such categorization in, in the Malay world, right? Um, and racial categories were more fluid, but we've, it's become more rigid now. So we're in a very peculiar situation where we have a president who is, by racial categorization, Indian, but who belongs to the Malay community, right? Only in Singapore, nowhere else in the world. <laughs> Well, actually in Malaysia too, because recently they, they were saying that Mahathir uh, was not really a Malay because you know, of his Indian uh, heritage. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, um, the oil issue, geopolitics, material interest comes much later. But when you have material interests like oil, economic interests like oil, um, then religion or culture is often brought in. Uh, to, um, you know, to strengthen claims that are uh, first and foremost not religious but uh, rather political or, or economic. But, um, uh, so for example, the, the, the Europeans um, in the 19th century, it was very common for the Europeans to, uh, you know, the French in, 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 uh, in Africa or in the Caribbean considered black people as, you know, subhuman. Um, now, uh, they considered, you know, in this part of the world, they considered the Chinese as, uh, you know, as, uh, ruthless and crude, uh, but um, submissive. And they had similar, they had other stereotypes about Malays and Indians and so on. Um, now, generally, these are ideas that emerge in the colonial period, um, sort of to justify colonial rule. Whether they really believe these things is another matter. I'm sure some of them did. But sometimes this othering takes place in order to justify a political position or to justify material interests. So just a quick uh, uh, follow-up to, to my question. So you were saying that, that othering had begun even before the, the, the Western uh, col col colonization. But, but because of, as you were saying, there's so much, so much development uh, joint development in Europe with, with uh, Islamic cultures, why wasn't there more of an assimilation uh, or a shared identity? Why, wasn't there, why was there this divide? Oh, that's a good point. Um, I, I think there, there, there were... Um, th there was assimilation or examples, uh, not, not assimilation, or I mean the assimilation of, of Islamic uh, culture. Um, that also did take place. We probably know and hear more about conflicts. For example, we, we hear of you know, crusades, but we don't hear so much about how Western Christians and Muslims live together in between the crusades. When, when Europeans uh, went to the to Palestine to fight. After the, the war, they didn't just all leave. Many of them stayed. Some of them intermarried with, uh, uh, with Muslims. Some of them stayed and became part of the, you know, the, the minority Christian uh, community. And they got along with each other. Uh, there are many examples of, uh, of that. You have examples of um, what you might call Islamophiles in Europe. 
Europeans who were so enamored by Islamic culture or Arabic or Turkish culture, uh, and this influenced their art, influenced their literature. There's such a thing called Romantic Orientalism. It's also based on othering in a positive sense, where you know, um, poets like um, Shelley, Byron, Wordsworth, apparently were influenced in a positive way by, by Islam. And, um, were interested in um, Islamic ideas and Islamic teachings. Um, and it was reflected in their, in their writings. Um, so there was that going on as well. But I think the dominant trend was, was to, uh, to, to vilify and to denigrate uh, Islam. And a lot of that, I think, um, had to do with you know, the centuries of conflict and also conquest. Uh, uh, hi, Prof. I have a question. So it's on like secularism and how it may be a potential stumbling blo block because like I, 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 I think I'm going to make some assumptions so like do correct me if I'm wrong then um, I think like I, in fact like for most of Europe it has entered like a postmodern age so like with like secularism is the prevailing like idea or norm so how do you see this as a potential stumbling block of like understanding between like the European civilization and like the Islamic world because like I think for the Islamic world there is like religion does play a cent central uh, part in like the political life or let's say how society is being organized mm. and in recent years uh, there seems to be a rejection of like the notion of secularism in like Turkey or like in Iran so do you see this as a potential div uh, divide or a stumbling block between like relations of of like the, the two civilizations yeah well I I, I, um, I don't see it should I don't see why it should be a stumbling block um, as long as Muslims don't demand that uh, Europe de-secularize itself, which they are not, other, other than some uh, crackpots in, in the UK who, who want you know, Sharia to be the main law of, uh, of, of, uh, of the UK. Right? But by and large, uh, Muslims are not demanding that, uh, expecting Europe to, to become you know, religious states. Um, also, when you say, you know, when you talk about secularism and you're you are saying that Muslims are against secularism, it's by, it's by no means, uh, I, I, I don't think the majority of Muslims are calling for an Islamic state. Uh, and also, the problem with secular, for Muslims, there are two different problems with secularism. For some Muslims, the issue is that they want an Islamic state. Um, even then, it's questionable that the majority of Muslims want that. In fact, a few years ago, a poll was conducted in Turkey. The majority of Turks do not want an Islamic state be because they say that they do not want the state to dictate how they should practice Islam. All they want is a state that allows them to practice Islam the way they want to. So it's interesting that the majority of Turks were not for an Islamic state. They're actually for a secular state. Um, um, but uh, the other aspect of uh, you know, secularism has to do with the role of religion in public life. So many Muslims say that there should be a role of religion in public life without there necessarily being an Islamic state. That the state should be informed by religious values, which is not the same thing as having an Islamic state. right? Um, so it depends on you know, what you mean by, by secularism. Many Muslims believe that it's better to live under a secular state because you have more freedom to, to practice as a Muslim than in a, a so-called Islamic state. Um, so I, I don't think the issue is about secularism versus, you know, secu versus non-secularism. It's really got to do with, um, um, with values values relating to pluralism, liberty, freedom, uh, and, and other such universal values. Thanks, Prof, for the, for the lesson just now. Um, quick question. I'm just wondering why it came to this case of, uh, I guess, the West ignoring or forgetting about the contributions of the Muslim world. Um, do you think that's a deliberate policy um, 
I'm thinking like you know the Spanish Inquisition and in Granada and things like that, that actually um, co coupled with colonialism, which actually erased the contribution of of the Islamic civilization, if you will, to Western. Uh, uh, yeah. The, so the my point. question is, um, do you think that the deliberate policy within uh, the Christian or the Western civilization to actually um, dis uh, dissociate itself from Muslim countries? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I wouldn't put it in terms of of deliberate policy, um, but th the thing is, since uh, since the nineteenth century, when when the West began to study Islam in a very um, systematic manner, you know, through their institutions through funding and also through in places where they colonized. They also um, promoted research on Islam. There has always been that very negative uh, attitude towards, towards Islam, coupled with a tendency to look at Islam through the lens of Christianity. Now, this is something, you know, you, you know, the, 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 the uh, the, the laudable thing about Western civilization is that they were, uh, for centuries, have been so interested in studying other civilizations, which you cannot say about the others. You see, the, the Indians, the Hindus, didn't do much studies on other civilizations. Neither did the Chinese, neither did the Muslims. Right? The, the Muslims did not specialize in the study of other religions or in the, in, the, in the geographies of other countries and go out to do research. But the West has, you know, for a long time been very interested in, uh, in the study of other civilizations. And we cannot attribute all of that to colonialism because um, even during the colonial period, there were many scholars among them who had a genuine interest in the study of other civilizations. So that's a good thing. But at the same time, there's always been this, uh, um, you know, this tendency to construct other um, um, cultures through their own lens. So ra rather than looking at Islam as a religion by itself, they, they look at it through the lens of Christianity, and then Islam ends up being a, an heretical form of Christianity. Um, and even worse, worse with uh, Hinduism, because they you know, they were, they, they, they made, in, in their own minds, made Hinduism conform so much to what they understood uh, the traits of religion to be. <coughs> so what they, the way they wrote about Hinduism is not recognizable to the Hindus themselves. And since they colonized India, they could put that into practice and uh, actually manufacture Hinduism in a sense, right? So, uh, that is a pe pe the pe peculiarity of, uh, of Western civilization. So along with that, you know, uh, and then if you combine that with colonial interests, you have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, distortions. Um, uh, the, the, the racial classifications of uh, peoples that came along with um, uh, colonialism and, you know, and went hand in hand with uh, with racism, the brutal treatment of, uh, especially in Africa, in India, in Indonesia also, Singapore and Malaya is, you know, relatively speaking, benign, but in Africa, the French in Africa, uh, you know, people talk about the Holocaust, uh, the Nazi Holocaust, but you know, the uh, what was done to this King Leopold, I think, this Belgian in the Congo was was. Uh, was a brutal genocide, right? And the slave trade. Um, so, uh, I think this is, you know, I forget what's the question. So, I was, well, I was wondering why uh, it came to this stage. Whether there was a deliberate for, uh, policy. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't think I don't I don't think there was a policy. But but um, you see, a lot of scholarship um, in colonial periods until the nineteen. 30s, 1940s, yeah? a lot of scholarship on Islam was very biased. If you just look at scholarship on Islam in, in Southeast Asia, 
there, there, there was a general bias. It, it's very clear. You can see that. Um, among the more, and I'm talking about the, the more well-known uh, Orientalists who studied Islam in the region. Uh, the tendency to, uh, to stress on the fatalism. The tendency to, uh, to stress on you know, the feudal aspects of Malay society. Um, dismissing Islam as uh, superficial in this part of the world. Um, they were more enamored with uh, the animistic side of uh, Malay Indonesian society, the, the scholarship, right? There was a, like, w w more of a one-sided uh, emphasis. I'm not saying these things are not true. Uh, you know, there is a very strong feudal tradition in Malay society. Um, but, you know, in line with the Orientalist and colonialist idea of inferiority of the Malays or the Javanese, for example, they stress on those topics which, uh, uh, you know, which, which um, contribute to, to their worldview, to their, to their, uh, their, um, their image of, uh, of the natives. Um, so even the topics that they choose, the literary text that they choose to analyze and study, emphasize that aspect. Whereas we have other aspects, uh, other texts, for example, that emphasize different aspects. You know, the, the Indian uh, sociologist, he lived about 100 years ago, um, Vinoy Kumar Sarkar, he said something similar about the way the, uh, the Europeans understand Hinduism, understood Hinduism. Whenever they talked about Hindu philosophy, they would stress the idealist aspects, as if Hinduism was simply idealist. They didn't talk about reality, they there was no material interpretations of, materialist interpretations of reality. Uh, there was, but if you read about Hinduism through Western scholars, you wouldn't get that. So, uh, this, is the same, this is the nature, I think, of Orientalist scholarship until the 1930s and 1940s. By, by then, uh, you start to have very serious scholarship, conscious of being objective about the study of, uh, of Islam. Thank you for your, uh, for your talk. So the book that you assigned was really interesting. It talked about the origins of the monotheistic religions, but then it talks about how it diverges, these sibling religions that diverge, and about how structurally Islam now functions very differently from, say, Catholicism or Protestantism, because it doesn't have a singular authority. Mm. So it's really interesting because this is a non-Muslim person who's talking about Islam, and your article, of course, was about its... Um, implications for multiculturalism. So, of course, non-Muslims have a certain tendency to be biased towards the versions of Islam that they prefer. Um, so how then, or what role do non-Muslims who are interested in sort of the multicultural or engagement then engage with the version of Islam that they are not um, therefore interested in? I mean, it's the same with the state in Singapore, how they prefer one type over another. And so what then, as this discussion is going on, this in, intra-religious discussion, what then do outsiders engage in without sort of picking favorites and, and looking for one who will love Asla, which is what the book was, was about? Thank you. Oh, so you're saying non-Muslims have a preference for certain versions of Islam? Right, so the, the author of the book was saying that Americans have a, have a preference, they look for the Arabs or the Muslims who like America, love America, who, who love Western perspectives. Uh, in Singapore, of course, the state has a certain preference for a kind of, or a brand of Islam practiced. Um, and of course, as we're saying here, as people who are not Muslim or even people who, who are not religious in general have a preference for um, the kinds of Muslims that they would rather engage with. Like Lee Kuan Yew would say, oh, you know, like last time these Malays would drink and they were liberal and they were easier to talk to. Mm. So how then... I mean, your article, of course, was about multiculturalism and beyond recognizing the origins and the similar starts, mm -hmm. now as the discussion intra-religion is going on, what role, if at all, do, I suppose, outsiders or non-Muslims have in engaging when, when the tendency exists for picking favorites? Huh? Yeah. I, I, I think this, this uh, fear or aversion um, to interacting with people because they they're too different from you, or they, in other words, they don't um, believe or practice a version of Islam that you are comfortable with. 
I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a sort of illusion, you know. Um, it, it's, sort of, it's, it's a psychological barrier that people need to, to, um, uh, to get over. Um, because we, you know, unless you're talking about a situation where you, know, you, you want to avoid, uh, a non-Muslim wants to avoid interacting with a Muslim who uh, thinks that you know, his or her blood is uh, fair game, right? Uh, but you know, <laughs> I guess there are Muslims like that, but there are not too many of them. Um, so we have to be, be able to, well, we have to learn to, to be able to interact with people who have um, uh, maybe different from us in terms of uh, some of their values and some of their ideals. Um, people are not that, all that different from each other. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, with, with perception. Most Muslims you know, have, have no difficulty or problem uh, interacting with, um, with others. Um, and we can see that in reality, they do come together for you know, common uh, causes. Uh, regardless of what you know, theological differences might be. Um, for example, th there would be similarities between uh, Catholics and uh, Muslims on the issue of uh, homosexuality. But you will find that there are um, certain groups among Muslims who are very um, you know, pro-LGBTQ uh, LG rights. And they would get along with uh, you know, those Christians who are also pro such rights. So you'll always find uh, you know, groups across the religious divide that have common interests and common uh, ideas. That, so you know, if, if you wanted to work with uh, Muslims, or Muslims wanted to work with people of other religions, then they'd have to seek out. It's not be being, the difference is not that you're Christian or you're Muslim. It's, you know, it's your values and uh, so I, I mentioned, um, well, you know, there are similarities between uh, a Salafi jihadi and, um, you know, a uh, redneck, uh, uh, you know, Christian fundamentalist, right? Both want their women to be in their proper place. Both think of their women as, uh, you know, baby-making uh, machines. Both, you know, consider women as um, probably less uh, rational and intelligent. One is Christian, one is Muslim, but they have similar values. So we can find people of similar values across the, the religious divide. There is an inter-religious organization of Singapore, which is quite active, and you do find a lot of common cause among the ten religions represented there. Thank you for your sharing. So you have mentioned um, uh, right now there is kind of like like, uh, like Christian versus Islam, this kind of uh, sentiments among people. Uh, but it seems that worldwide, right, um, the kind of like tension between uh, various religions may not be just restricted to Christian versus Muslim. Say it's like in, in India, there could be Hindu versus Muslims and, you know, in Myanmar recently, then maybe that's not totally religious, but uh, that's kind of like Buddhist versus uh, Muslims. And even in, like, say, China, it could be like atheists versus Muslims. So in, in line of that, right, um, what suggestions do you give to people um, in order to, you know, reconcile themselves with each other and, um, you know, as in reconcile with the kind of the differences with each other. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, um, actually, the article that I sent to you, the one I wrote, talks about, I think, three prerequisites of multiculturalism or three, three requirements of multi, multiculturalism. So I've, I've talked about it there. Um, but let me just say this. You know, there's a tendency nowadays to, to blame, to cite religion as a cause of conflict. 
Now that's not true. The cause of conflict is being human. Right? Because humans have identity issues. Identity issues may revolve around religion, they may revolve around gender, they may revolve around class, they may revolve around ethnicity, around uh, uh, nationality, and so on and so forth, right? And we have seen conflicts um, um, that revolve around identity issues, um, but not concerning religion. Um, in fact, in the modern period, far more people, far more life and property has been destroyed in the name of non-religious ideologies than religious ideologies. Religion is spectacular, but it's not responsible for such numbers of deaths. Spectacular in the sense you have, you know, first of all, it happens during peace times. And then, you know, you have, you know, the destruction of the Twin Towers, you know, a few thousand people died. If, <laughs> if that is done by Muslims, that's another matter, right? Um, but then, you know, and you have suicide bombing, you have this, which Muslims do. Um, but um, you look at the modern period, we're not talking about a few thousand here and a few thousand there, we're talking about millions. Uh, in the name of uh, Nazi socialism, fascism, millions killed. In the name of communism, millions in the Soviet Union. And I'm, I'm not talking about war. War is also another thing, right? These countries go to war and they kill millions. But even outside of war, like the Nazi Holocaust is not about war. Um, the, 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 you know, in Stalin's time, the, the millions killed. Pol Pot, Cambodia. In the name of democracy, in the name of liber liberalism, in the name of you know, freedom, the, uh, look what the Americans did in, in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's barbaric. And it's even being supported and justified by some of the clerics. Not only by lay people, but some of the religious uh, uh, you know, scholars are justifying uh, the, you know, the, the um, killing of uh, these Japanese. Um, yet we don't. We, we see, you know, we see America as a civilized uh, country. Iran is not a civilized country. It's a rogue state. Iran never harmed anybody. Uh, Iran has, for since the Sassanid times, which is you know pre-Islamic times, they, when they were an imperial power, but they were always a state conquered by others. Even more recently, they were they they, they were. Uh, you know, they were subject to the hostility of Iraq, supported by American and British uh, funds and, and weapons. Um, no Iranian has been responsible for a suicide bomb or trying to blow up a plane or a building or anything like that. But you see, Iran is demonized. And the, the civilized countries of the world are, you know, respected. Um, Saudi Arabia is massacring Yemen, Yemeni children. And the U.S. sells billions of dollars of arms to Saudi Arabia, most recently. Even most recently, when Trump went to Saudi Arabia recently. Uh, so we need to, you know, uh, to, to call a spade a spade. I'm in no way defending Muslim terrorists, and I'm not excusing what they do. Um, what they do is criminal. But I can't say to you in all conscience that, what, that when the US and the, and the UK invaded Iraq, it's not a criminal act. And that selling weapons to countries that are, that, that are in the business of bombing hospitals and schools is not a criminal act. So they're not terrorists. Because you know, terrorism means means something particular. It's a kind of criminality that has a specific definition. But what about states that are in in the business of war, right? Okay, it doesn't come under terrorism, but to me, 
you know, it's a form of uh, criminality when these wars are illegal, and there is a view that some of these wars are actually illegal by international standards. Yeah. I forgot your question, actually. What? Ah, so I was saying, therefore, that you know, um, the media um, makes a spectacle of religion, but um, I, I don't think religion is the greatest danger to, uh, to modern civilization, if you look at the record. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, we'll see you next week with the topic on the GCC. Thank you. Thank you.